All right, good evening. Let's all stand, please. We're going to sing uh, this song tonight. 656, 656. Let's find our place, our seats, and let's turn to 656. Let's, let's sing this song tonight. This world is not my home. Four verses, let's sing them all. 656. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond. singing there, you may be seated, Brother Cody. All right, Brother Evans, do you have a uh, missions letter for us this evening? Is that right? You do have? Okay. We're going to have a missions letter here. It's always good to uh, put a plug in for the missionaries, <clears throat> and uh, I'd, I'd like to encourage everyone to, when you can, read the, the missions letters, mission letters from all of our missionaries that we support. And uh, I'm reading in uh, Matthew 24, 14, it said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So we have. We think about the nations in the world. At this point, there's probably been a missionary or a preacher or someone toting the Bible. But still, these countries and nations have broken up through the years, and there's still a lot of unreached people in the world. And to think about the billions of people throughout the world, close to 8 billion, I think it is. I can't even think that big. And I, 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 I can't imagine out of that many people how many people are lost. And uh, I read some statistics and that every second two people die in the world. Every second two people are going out into eternity. And it's our job to carry on the Great Commission. And we support our missionaries, and that's good. 
but we need to support them with prayer, support them with money. We get a chance to encourage them. They are heroes of the faith. But I want to read one from uh, Tom Sloan, Brother Tom Sloan in uh, Chiapas, Mexico. He'd been here several times. We've known Brother Sloan for a long time. And they have got started building uh, radio stations, and, and uh, they're working on another one now, which will be their eighth radio station. They're reaching down into Guatemala and uh, Venezuela and all over Mexico, and it's amazing. But I want to read this real quick, and I'll get out of the way. It says, does radio really work? Well, one of the greatest pleasures of radio ministry are the testimonies we receive from our listeners. Rene Cornelio listens to Compassion Radio 104.3. FM, and he lives in Santa Domingo in the state of Tabasco, a five-hour drive from this radio station. Rene contacted us and said he listens to Compassion Radio all day, every day, and has done so for several years. He contacted us to encourage us to be faithful to preach the gospel of Christ, which he came to believe when he heard the gospel preached on Compassion Radio. Primitivo from California listens on the internet, Radio. Dot compassion org and says, I would like to thank the staff at Compassion Radio for the many blessings I have received through the preaching of the gospel. You have no idea how the gospel has transformed my life. I pray that God give you the necessary wisdom to continue to be a great blessing to all of your radio listeners because the message of the gospel that you all preach on the radio is much needed during these times of great confusion as it brings great relief to my soul. In Y'all know as well as I do the times we're living in. They're troubled, sinful, evil. People all over the world are celebrating sin. And we need to celebrate the love of Jesus Christ and get that point across to these people. And that's what they're doing through the radio stations. Are they listening? Yes, they are. When we preach the gospel of Christ, God gives them the faith to believe and he saves them. Radio really does work because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Through your faithful prayers and support, you, friends, are partakers with us of the grace and joy. We continue to press ahead with the Sonoro Radio Project. We're in the process of, of obtaining the necessary legal documents for this radio station. I ask that you help us with your prayers as we navigate this part of the project. And thank you very much from the depths of our heart. And we need to keep them in prayer. There's a lot of red tape to go through when you start a radio station, get it legal, and, and it's out of, out of my territory. I don't know anything about it, but I know there'll be a lot of red tape to go through in getting a, a radio station on the air and get legit. So keep the Sloans in prayer and all of our missionaries, but that, that's, uh, that's all I can say. Keep them in your prayers. Thank you. Amen. It's always a blessing when we get to hear that something the Lord has used us for has made a difference. Um, we don't always get to hear that, though, do we? And sometimes I think we wonder uh, if what we're doing is making a difference, whether it's, you know, in the, in, in the realms of the Great Commission, knocking on doors, passing out tracts. We wonder, is it, does it make a difference? Um, sometimes it might be teaching a Sunday school class or preaching or just raising kids, and you wonder, is what I'm doing making a difference? But the fact of the matter is there's a lot of difference made that we don't get to hear about. Uh, but, you know, the, the admonition from the Lord is be not weary in well-doing. Uh, you will reap in due season if you faint not. So our job is to just keep plugging away, keep doing what God's told us to do, and he will add the increase. There will be a difference made in lives. We may not know it here on this side of eternity, but certainly on the next we'll be made aware of that. So we'll be praying for the Sloans. That's a blessing to hear that. Uh, let's get our prayer list out tonight. If you have those, if you need those, raise your hand. If you need one still, and we'll get those to you. I think I uh, have just a few here. Just a couple announcements while we're getting those. Uh, we obviously need to be praying uh, this evening and through the remainder of this week for uh, the folks that are at, uh, at youth camp. Uh, Pastor and Miss Crystal are there with just a, about 15 of our youth from the church here. So uh, special, special opportunity there for God to work in hearts, and we're praying for that to happen. All right, We ought to be anyway. So be praying for them. Um, this coming Sunday evening, there's going to be a not-so-secret sisters meeting over here in the uh, Home Builders class after the evening service Sunday. So just make a note of that. Keep that in mind. Now, next Wednesday... 
Uh, there's going to be another wedding shower uh, for Josh Kuykendall and Grace Lorenz. Uh, just uh, do keep that in mind. That's next Wednesday night after the services. Um, and then next week, we'll also have our missions committee meeting as well as the officers meeting on Thursday and Friday evening. But if you got your prayer list out, I've got just a few things highlighted here. Under health, family, and friends, I have highlighted a few names here. Chad Hazelwood, Jake McClanahan, and then Chris Kite and Christopher Jones. And I don't know if you're like me, sometimes when I'm going down through some of these names, I don't remember every specific need, uh, but I often think of you know, what Paul says to the people that he writes to. He writes to different churches, to different people, and he says to them often, I make mention of you in my prayers, and you know, it makes a difference when we just make mention, even if we can't remember the very specific need Make mention with a, with, a, with a pure heart before God, and he knows the needs, amen? So be praying for those folks. And then under health church members, I have the Pulsini family highlighted here. And then Miss Sue Schneider I have highlighted. It's good to see her uh, back there. So, uh, and then I, I've got written in here Miss Gwen Wasdorp, and uh, she's uh, got some, some good news I heard. Um, I don't know if that's true. But I heard that she got some good news. So, but be praying for her and that uh, that foot that she has fractured. And then their church ministries. We're praying for Victor this week. I'd be praying for him and thankful for everything that he does in the music ministry and getting the specials all lined out and a lot of work involved in that. And just thankful for him. So be praying for him this week. Under missionaries, I have highlighted the Barlow family to Slovenia, and then the Schmutzler family to Mongolia. And then on the back of our list, uh, be praying for the uh, remaining Lorenz wedding. Grace is coming up here in just uh, three or four weeks, so be praying, praying for that wedding and just uh, that everything goes smoothly and that Miss Crystal can get everything done that needs to be done. And then military, we're praying for Micah Barlow this week. And then under cancer, I have highlighted here Michelle Kimball. Vicki Schelling, and Debbie Byrne. And then be praying for those visitors that we've had, just that the Lord will uh, meet the needs in their life, that he'll use us to minister to them, uh, that he'll guide and direct them, uh, help him, them to understand his will for their life, whether that be salvation uh, or church membership somewhere. Be praying for those recent visitors, the contacts, and those that we have listed here that need salvation. And then we will take just a few prayer requests or praise reports tonight. If you have some of those, uh, we'll do those. Is there, uh, actually, I think I just sprung that on you. We weren't expecting to do that, were we? Well, it, do we have anything? We'll use our vocal cords tonight. Go ahead there. Well, amen. Amen. 1994. That was 19. Is that right? So that's 29, 20, 29 years. Man, my math is bad. But 20, 29 <laughs> years ago. Okay. 29 well, years. Praise the Lord. It was so exciting. And um, so I just praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. And amen. then I can see the Lord um, working in my son Lee's life. And so I'm really excited about. Good. Um. I'm really excited about that, that he's working in his life. I'm glad well, to see Well, amen. We'll, you would just pray for Lee, all right? Uh, write his name down there and pray for him. Amen. Got something over here? Miss Dawn. Um, it's a praise and a continued request for my dad. Um, this past year, of course, has been rather challenging for him but he has really been steadfast in his faith and he has held to promises that you know that God puts forth in his word for him and for all of us he has just been an incredible witness when I take him to various doctor's appointments he is he is such an incredible witness to whoever is is sitting there he'll he'll talk about you know, mom, and he'll talk about salvation, and he'll talk about his role in in the church, and etc. And we walk away from every appointment with him being encouraged. 
and the people being encouraged mm -hmm. and then they walk away like wow they were married for this long and he's still able to I mean, it's just a big circle and I just sit there and get to drink it all in mm -hmm. um, if you would continue and that's a praise because I mean that's you know they were married 50 forever years basically and the request is Friday marks a year and so he he still he still cries and he's still emotional and he still misses her as anyone would but if you would pray extra measures of grace over the coming days and that we can we can get him through the next week or so and then he gets to go back to his beloved Colorado and 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 carry on and and do well he walks his miles every morning so he's he's still he knows he still has purpose he know God is still using him and so he's he's content so I, I appreciate right. your prayers and I ask for them to continue certainly and that's brother Billy Patrick will be praying for him he's under health family and friends there if you just highlight him and be praying for him brother Mike yes um prayer for two churches back in my hometown in Missouri. Um, one, I did most of my growing up in and graduated high school before I went in the Air Force. They, I believe two weeks ago, lost their pastor. And um, another church in Malden, uh, Brother Childers, Stephen Childers, he's an independent Baptist preacher. Um, they are losing their building this month so I just you know it's all coincidence right but um, I contacted the member of the pulpit committee at Kimball and they are Southern Baptist I'm sorry they are Southern Baptist so there's a little difference there um, on the way things are done but I gave Brother Childers information to her to them and they're supposed to make contact in some way or another and um, of course there's some sticking points um, brother Childers is all KJV I don't see an issue there but he's not Southern Baptist Convention not leaning that direction so mm -hmm. they've got some things to work out if it proceeds but please be in prayer for those two churches certainly and a lot of times those those churches that have been with the convention for some time the the people don't have necessarily a leaning that way. Sometimes a new pastor comes in and he can he can assist in getting them out of that and taking them down uh, the more scripturally sound path. So we're praying for them. But Jason. Boy in the in the uh, hospital tonight uh, uh, went down with uh, with some heat uh, heat related illness you know probably just shy of heat exhaustion probably um, putting some IVs in them I think they're gonna release them here this evening but um, you know just for a for a quick recovery there um, and everybody needs, needs to be aware of it it's uh, it's hard. yeah absolutely Joe Martinez okay miss Gwen I did receive good news, and I want to thank everyone for praying. Um, the doctor said I will not have to have surgery, and so that is a big blessing. Yes. Um, but also, um, I'm just thankful for the people who prayed for me. I received several texts and even some little comments from little kids as they have walked by or a parent has mentioned that they were praying for me, and so that, that means a lot, and so I just want to thank the Lord for that as well. Praise the Lord. That's good. Anything else tonight before we go to prayer? Ms. Rena. Okay. Jeremiah and Cheney. Here in town. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to Lord in prayer this evening, and then we'll continue with services. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. God, just for loving us, God, the way you take care of us. And, Lord, just the, the various praises tonight, Lord, are a reminder to us uh, that, God, every one of us are a testimony of your grace. And, Lord, I pray that you help us to, uh, 
Lord, recognize your goodness in our life. And, Lord, even, even in the trials, even, Lord, in the valleys, God, you take care of us. And there's blessings there. And, Lord, you strengthen us and you uh, show us your way more perfectly, Lord. And we're just thankful, God, the way you work in our life. Uh, Lord, help us not to take that for granted. Lord, I just ask tonight that you be with these requests that have been offered up. Lord, there's various ones, Lord, for, for health. There's churches that need, uh, Lord, your wisdom and your direction. Uh, God, there's lives that you're working on, putting back together. God, there's, there's people that need your grace. And, Lord, we just ask that, uh, Lord, according to your wisdom, according to your power and ability, Lord, that you would work. Uh, Lord, in each and every circumstance uh, in life, Lord, uh, God, I pray that you help us to be faithful, God, where we can, where we can make a difference. Uh, God, if there's something we can do to be a help, if there's something that we can do to uplift somebody or encourage somebody, uh, God, if it's, if it's someone here that needs to carry the gospel, God, I pray that you'd burden our hearts. God, would you help us to surrender, yield ourselves wholly to you, Lord, that we might be used for your glory. Lord, we just ask that as Brother David Schneider comes here in just a few moments to uh, deliver your word, God, that our hearts be here. Uh, God, that our minds not be wandering uh, to and fro. God, that we not be thinking about the events of this day or, uh, God, the plans for tomorrow. But, God, that we be here in, in heart, in mind. Uh, Lord, that we take in, that we have ears to hear, God, what it is that you'd say to us tonight. And, Lord, that we would respond. Lord, that we would be obedient to the word, uh, God, that is preached. Would you just bless him as he delivers it, God? Give him power and wisdom. Give him a clarity of thought, clarity of speech, Lord, and again, help us to listen. Lord, we do pray for those that aren't with us this evening, God, as they're away at camp. Lord, the youth of Bible Baptist Church, and we're thankful for them. Uh, God, we are a blessed church. Uh, Lord, there's so many independent Baptist churches that are uh, of our brand, God, so to speak, that uh, they don't have the youth, God, because the youth are... Uh, going off after the world and the things of this world. And, Lord, we're thankful to have a good number of youth here at Bible Baptist Church. And, Lord, I pray that you help us to be faithful to minister to them, uh, God, to teach them your word, and I believe we do. But, God, I ask in a special way that as they're away at camp this week, God, that you would uh, maybe burden their hearts about something specific in their life, God, maybe some calling, uh, maybe some direction, God. Just help them to have some clarity, uh, Lord, regarding your will for their life. Uh, Lord, maybe it's some sin, maybe it's some area, Lord, where you want them to be more faithful. God, whatever it is, Lord, would you work in their hearts and, Lord, protect them and keep, uh, give them safety, Lord, in the heat. Uh, Lord, just keep them safe, bring them back to us safely. Uh, Lord, we ask your blessing on the remainder of this service, God, as we uh, again lift up your, your name in song, uh, Lord, then, and then as well as the preaching. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please, and we're going to continue with our singing, 588, 588. Let's sing this song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. His grace, I'll cast 
shout, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, may I thy consolation share, till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight. sing song there 306 please for our last hymn tonight 306 <clears throat> only a sinner saved by grace it's a good song that I'll hear as well not have I gotten but what I received grace have bestowed it since I have believed boasting excluded pride I abase I'm all I was foolish and sin ruled my heart. Seek my footsteps from God to depart. Jesus hath found me happy, my case. I now am a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God. The glory, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Tears unveiling, no merit had I. Mercy had saved me, or else I must die. Sin had alarmed me, fearing God's face, but now I'm a sinner saved by grace. sinner whose heart overflows, loving his Savior to tell what he knows, wants more to tell it, would I embrace, I'm only a sinner saved by grace, only a sinner saved by grace, only a sinner saved by grace, this is my story to Great singing, you may be seated. And at this time, we're going to take up our offering.
pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for watching over us and protecting us. Just thank you for the many gifts you give us, Lord, just this day being one of them. Lord, we pray that you'd uh, be with the request that we brought to you tonight. Pray that you'd uh, just work in each of those different situations. Pray that you'd, uh, again, Lord, be with those that are at camp and touch them. Pray that you take this offering, Lord, and you spread your word. Pray that we'd uh, be able to hear something from your word tonight and take it and apply it to our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand and turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. Right before I got up here, uh, Brother Citizen came by and shook my hand and said, be kind to us tonight. <laughs> and I can only be as kind as the word of God is as far as the text goes. I have to be loyal to that. Uh, but it is my intention to at least be kind to you tonight in the terms of length. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. Second Kings chapter 6. And we'll begin reading in verse number 8. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse number 8, the Bible says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring, ye, bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. And, when it came, er, and it came to pass, when they were coming to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And Lord, opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with the sword and with the bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Let's go to the Lord this evening in prayer, and then we'll get into the message. Dear Lord, again, so grateful to be in your house tonight, Lord, to sing a song like Sweet Hour of Prayer and recognize that in our moments of distress and grief and moments of, of battle and trouble, as our text points out, Lord, that you are just a whispered prayer away, Lord, that... Uh, the help and the resources that we desperately need for any activity, Lord, and especially for ministry, are bountiful at your hand, Lord. And so I pray for those this evening, Lord, that uh, as your word is open and as uh, I do my very best, uh, humanly speaking, to preach it, Lord, that the resources that are desperately needed for preaching, the Holy Spirit's conviction and your guidance would be all over this place, Lord, and that you would be glorified 
by both the preaching and by the hearing of your listeners, Lord. I pray again that we'd be submitted people to what you have to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. What year was America's first civil war started? Going once. 1861 is a great guess, but it's wrong. 1865 is another great guess, but it's also wrong. Brother Evans. Huh? 1860 is also wrong. I know many of you are thinking 1861. That's when they fired on Fort Sumter and started what we know as the American Civil War. But 1776 was America's first civil war. And I go, you're ah, that's a trick question. You were never going to give anybody that dollar. Uh, but it's really a matter of perspective on what constitutes a civil war. We celebrated just a few weeks ago uh, our Independence Day. But just for the t- turn of a tide in that war could have been called Separatist Revolution Day. And we could all be speaking a different form of English this evening. Uh, It's actually not even our, when we get to 1861, that's not even their second civil war. That was, the honor is claimed by the Toledo War, you may or may not be familiar with, fought in 1836 between the states of Ohio and Michigan. Yes, this bad blood goes back decades. Uh, there was a 436-mile territory that both sides claimed as theirs, and Michigan appealed for statehood to Congress. And when they appealed to co- for Congress to make them a state, they claimed this 436-square-mile territory, and Ohio wasn't going to have it. So they assembled their militias, went down to the banks of the Toledo River, and they fired some shots. They stabbed one law enforcement officer, and then the the the... Governors put a halt to it, and the compromise was, was made that the loser had to take Toledo with them, and then uh, uh, Michigan got the upper peninsula there. That's, that's the second civil war, and then by the time you get to 1861, we have the third American Civil War. Wars are often fought there over a matter of perspective. Whether you're Ohio or Michigan, on either side of the river, you're both deciding that that land is territory that your family owns, that your state claims. Whether you're a loyalist Tory to the English party and said that, no, there wasn't an independence, that declaration wasn't worth the paper it was signed on, this is just a British colony and rebellion against a British king. It's really just a matter of perspective. Uh, wars are often fought over perspective. The who wins is sometimes a matter of perspective. Perspective is a thing that dominates the passage that we're in, and in no small measure because it is a war. It's a a war that's fought between two belligerent parties, uh, as all wars are. But knowing who the participants are, what they're fighting about, helps to unlock this passage for the first readers. As the guy sat down and he penned the book of 2 Kings, he knew that uh, you'd be familiar with the king of Syria and the king of Israel and what they're fighting about. And helps us to understand the perspective of the text and what it relevance it has to your perspective almost two millennia later. So first I want to introduce to you this king of Syria. His name is Ben-Hadad. You read about him in verse number 8. He says, then the king of Syria warred against Israel. To understand something about Ben Hadad and his perspective, you have to go back to Second or to First Kings chapter twenty. That's the last time we really saw him in action. Ben Hadad had uh, just taken the throne. He had seen this Israeli power rise uh, under Omri and then under King Ahab had become a, a, a solidified military might. And so he wanted them off his doorstep. So he goes and he besieges Samaria and he gets his tail kicked. And so he runs home to Mama. And uh, then uh, the, his counselors come to him and say, "Hey, well, it's it's because you fought in the in the mountains place, and their god is a god of mountains. But if you come in and you." Uh, attack them in the valley, then, then you'll, you'll defeat them. So they go down to Aphek, and they have a second battle there. And again, they lose because the god of the mountain is still the same god that's there in the valley. And so uh, Ben-Hadad goes home, and he, he starts to lick his wounds. Before he leaves, uh, Ahab circles Aphek, and they, they find Ben-Hadad holed up in an inner compartment there. And uh, his, soul, his servants come to him and say, hey, if you put sackcloth on your head, if you put a rope around it, and you come out there and you say, hey, uh, uh, Ahab, would you be for, merciful to us? Their God is a merciful God, and you might just get away with this whole thing. And so they do. They go to Ahab, and they say, uh, Ben-Hadad is still alive, and we'd like to be reconciled to you. And Ahab says those faithful words, Ben-Hadad, is he still alive? He is my brother. You can read about that in 1 Kings chapter 20. Ahab is very wrong in that never. Ben-Hadad is not his brother, but he signs a covenant with Ben-Hadad. He signs a peace treaty with him, a, a non-aggression pact, but also an alliance. Because there's a third rising power now called Assyria. 
uh, and they start to push into the Syrian camp, and this is not recorded in your Bible, but we know this from history, that Ben-Hadad forms an alliance with Ahab, the king of Israel, and nine other nations. They go to war against uh, Assyria, and they prevail. They push Assyria back. Um, and they form this little 11-nation coalition. So time goes on. Assyrians start to lick their wounds. They start to push into Syria again. But this time, the alliance that he has with Ahab is dead because Ahab's dead. His son Jehoram takes over the throne. We last heard about Jehoram in 1 Kings chapter 3 when he tried to invade Moab with another one of those little three-nation coalitions. It didn't go well for him, and he's still licking his wounds. So he says to Ben-Hadad, no. I'm not going to form this coalition. I've learned my lesson to not uh, uh, ally myself with heathen parties. I'm going to stay here in Israel. You're going to have to go fight this battle on your own. And Ben-Hadad doesn't like this. He thinks he should have to honor the treaty and fight Assyria. He wants to uh, remove now Jehoram and put somebody else on the throne. You read in verse number 8, it says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. That's not normally how we fight wars, but this is the strategy. He's going to send raiding parties into Israel, to kill specifically the king of Israel, Jehoram. If he can kill that king, he can put a puppet in his, in his stead, and then he can rehonor the alliance and have Israel's armies at his back when he goes to fight against Assyria. That's his perspective. He wants to remove the king of Israel, get him off the throne, and put somebody that will uh, ally with him on it. But from God's perspective, this is bigger than just one man. and certainly bigger than some heathen king. So verse number 9 says, The man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware thou pass not such a place, for, the thither, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place where the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. So God in, injects himself into the situation. He stirs up Elisha and says, Elisha, uh, the, the, the nation of Syria is going to try to ambush Jehoram at this camp. He's going to try and send these raiding parties to assassinate uh, Jehoram. And I want you to go down there and warn him. Now, Elisha and Jehoram have not always been on the best of terms. In fact, the last time we see them face to face, Jehoram, uh, or Elisha looks Jehoram in the eyeballs and says, if it wasn't for the king of Judah standing right here next to you, I wouldn't even look at you. Go home to your father and your mother's God. Don't, don't come and treat me anymore. That was the relationship that they had. But here, two chapters later, something's changed. Oh, a couple events have happened. We know Naaman the Syrian got healed, and uh, that was Elisha's doing. That was interceding on Jehoram's behalf. And now Jehoram has rejected this alliance with Ben-Hadad. He has learned his lesson, and he's sort of submitted to God's leadership here. Now, Jehoram's still a wicked king. He's still a bad guy. But as far as we can tell from this text, this is the, 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 the spiritual highlight of his life that he has started to um, reject outside influence. And so God uh, stirs up Elisha to go to him. And whether position or whether the growth of Jehoram has changed uh, Elisha's mind and, and God's dealings with him, he warns him and saves his life, the Bible says, not once nor twice, which means three, maybe four, maybe five times. We don't know how many uh, it took Syria to kind of learn what was going on here. But God is specifically intervening in Jehoram's life to save his life. Again, because this issue, this perspective from God's perspective is bigger than even a wicked king on the throne of Israel. You know, there were no real good kings of Israel. They're all wicked kings, but they're all still bearing Jehovah's name. And if God's going to allow this, this king Ben-Hadad to come in and assassinate the man on the throne and, and just kind of install a puppet government there, then the kingdom of God as a whole is going to suffer. Not just the political nation of Israel, but the advancement of God's mission on planet Earth, the, the gospel centeredness of it in, in this Old Testament is going to be diminished by allowing this outside influence to take control. So God intervenes in this behalf. The king of Syria learns about it in verse number 11. says, therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He says, hey, who's spying on us? Who's, who's revealing my secrets? You've, you've been in that, that kind of scenario uh, where you line your kids up. You've see, seen the broken vase and you want to know, okay, well, who did it? And so each kid kind of looks at the other kid. Uh, uh, just the past week, uh, I, I'm looking on my cell phone and uh, my kids are allowed to play on my cell phone on occasion under supervision, but they're not allowed to download anything. And I pop up my cell phone and there's five brand new games on there that I didn't download. 
Okay, so I do the same, same routine. I call my kids to the carpet and say, okay, who's downloading games on dad's cell phone? And Adam looks at me, and, uh, and Lincoln looks at me, uh, and not all of them, both of them are 100% truthful all the time. So we did a little bit of interrogation there to find out. Turns out, uh, if you Google it, uh, Samsung just had an update, and they automatically downloaded five games. So it was nobody's fault. They were both innocent in telling the truth. So uh, that's kind of the scenario here is all those, uh, Hebrew, all, all those Syrian servants, they come to the king, and they're like, well, it, it's not Fred and it's not Ted, so I don't know who it can be. Uh, uh, but one of them steps forward and says, hang on a second, King. None of us are guilty of this thing. Uh, none of us did this. Uh, there's a man in, 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 in Israel named Elisha, and he's, he can tell you from God's perspective the secrets that you whisper in your bedchamber. There's nobody that's here against you, King of Syria. There's no one that's trying to subvert you, Ben-Hadad. But you're warring against God himself in this endeavor. The Bible just calls that person um, one of his servants. But let's do a little deduction here. It's a servant that's familiar with Elisha. It's a servant that's um, in such a high-ranking position that he advises the king of Syria on military strategy. And it's a person that's submitted to understanding what God's uh, abilities are on planet Earth. Uh, I can't prove to you that this is name in the Syrian, but man, the hints are there. That, that God is, is using this person that Elisha has healed in chapter 5 to come before the king and say, hey, you will not succeed in this endeavor. God is warning you here. He's giving you two, not once, not twice, but more multiple chances to turn away from this action because you cannot succeed when you war against God. It's interesting that God uses Elisha to prevent warfare here. That there's battles that could be being fought. King Assyria could come in and he could kill uh, Jehoram. He could, he could have that assassination go on and there would be battles there. Uh, maybe he could subvert it two, one or two or three times and have a, a larger battle there. But God is using Elisha to uh, change the direction of human events to avoid warfare. Which tells me that there are some battles that the nation of Israel got into that God allowed into their life. And there were some battles in the nation of Israel's life that God bypassed from them. And that's important for us to recognize, that God knows what battles you're going to face before you even know that you're in them. Uh, that God chose at this time to realize there were battles in Jehoram's life that could have happened to him, but God protected him from even the appearance of warfare by sending this uh, prophetic word to him to avoid that. And that's important to us because sometimes we get the perspective that I'm facing battle after battle after battle and that God just got it out for me or that I, I, I'm, I'm feeling such a difficult time in life and this should really just be easier being a Christian here. But God's only allowing the battles into our life that he wants into our life. All the ones he doesn't want into our life, he bypasses. It's like he puts a colander over our lives. And if you don't know what a colander is, it's sometimes called a spaghetti strainer. Okay, you're with me? Uh, it's the bucket with the holes in the bottom. He pours in all the events that could happen to your life, but only the ones that he wants to get through. And that should change our perspective on the battles that we face. If God, uh, if a battle is taking place in your life, it's a battle that God has allowed into your life for a reason. Whether that reason is for you to shine forth his glory in the battle and let others see his success in it. Or whether that battle is coming up to teach you something, to help you to grow as a Christian. Or maybe that battle is there to uh, knock you upside the head as we've done some to kids and tell you, wake up boy, you need to understand the situation that you're in. God knows the battles we will face before we ever get into them. The king of Israel doesn't understand this. He hears the counsel. He says, you won't win against God because God's bypassing the battles. God's allowing the battles. He's the sovereign that's on the throne. And he tries to stop the prophetic word in verse number 13. He says, and he said, go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. Okay, so he gives up on the secrecy attempt, and now he said, if I'm going to succeed in my ability to take over Israel, I've got to get this man Elisha out of there. In fact, I want you to go, I want you to fetch him and bring him out, I want you to capture him. Maybe I can twist him and make him work for uh, Syrian. If he has this kind of uh, a prophetic knowledge, he could be a, a great asset for us. So he sends a great host, the Bible says, and surrounds the city of Dothan. Dothan is a small uh, stronghold that's just north of Samaria. It's like a, a guardhouse there, so it's not a great big city, but it is a fortified city. And so the, the, the Syrians, they come up in a great ho host, great 
host of horses and chariots. They surround that city by night and they wait for the morning when they're going to go in and kidnap Elisha. God uh, injects a little bit of humor into the situation um, as we get to see this story from the perspective of Gehazi, uh, uh, Elisha's servant. The Bible says in verse number 15, that when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host come past the city, both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Uh, I can't read that necessarily, I think, the way that it went down. Uh, you see like Gehazi, it says, the Bible says he woke up very early in the morning. So he gets up, he, he does his stretches, he gets his morning coffee, and he goes and he looks out there at his window, and he says, ah, oh, there, there's the beautiful city of Samaria, just, like, just where she was last night when I went to bed. And there, there's the stronghold of Dothan, just like I left it when I, when I went to bed last night. And there's the Syrian army, just like I, Syrian army. Alas, master! And he runs back in there, and he says, how shall we do? Uh, Master, what's going on here? Uh, Those guys weren't here last night when we went to bed. We have a problem. Every commentary I read stressed that this is the normal reaction to seeing the host of Syria. That Gehazi's actions were uh, those of a normal individual. And I think that's uh, important that we would probably respond uh, in many ways just like he did. Uh, As Americans, we're very divorced from the idea of an invading army. I mean, even uh, probably our greatest memory of, of warfare from our time is September 11th, when so many Americans died. Even in that scenario, it happened in a faraway place to people we didn't know or, or knew distantly. I'm not sure of everyone's life here. But none of us have ever woken up and seen a Syrian army on our doorstep. And by God's grace, we never will. But just a chapter over, you can read what the Syrian army is like. Uh, ben Hadad is going to be succeeded by a man named Haziel. And Elisha's going to have an interaction with Haziel uh, where Elisha's crying. And the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 8, and verse number 12, And Haziel, Haziel said, Why weepeth my Lord? And Elisha answered, said, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire. Their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and will rip up their women with child. That's the perspective of the Syrian army that Gehazi knows about. He wakes up there and says, this isn't just some faraway place. This is right at my doorstep, a battle of violent significance. And so it's somewhat understandable his reaction. Alas, my master. These are the people that set strongholds on fire. What are we going to do? It's understandable that he would be afraid of the army. But it's not entirely understandable that he wouldn't know what was going to happen. See, Gehazi's seen a lot. He's seen Elisha um, call down some she-bears on some people. Uh, He's seen Elisha raise a child back to life. He's seen God work mightily through Elisha. He's seen him cure leprosy and curse with leprosy. He knows of Elisha's acquaintance with God. And yet, right now, all he can see, all his perspective can entail, is that of an invading Syrian army. And so in verse number 16, Elisha tells him, you need to change your perspective. God knows the battles we're going to face, and you need to understand that this battle that we're facing right now isn't just a physical, secular battle. This is a spiritual battle. In fact, every battle we face, Gehazi, from this point and every point, is going to be a spiritual battle. There is no difference in warfare between secular warfare and spiritual warfare. Every battle that takes place in a person's life is a battle in the spiritual realm. Verse number 16 says, And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. There's more numerous on our side. Verse number 17, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. He says, Gehazi, you're not seeing the realities of the situation. You can count the secular Syrian chariots, but you are not counting the people that are on our side. You're not counting the resources of the God that you have. Lord, I pray you, would you just open his eyes and let him see what's really going on here? The Bible says in verse number 17 that, the young man, uh, the, eyes of the, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots r- of fire round about Elisha. God opens his eyes, lets him see into a, a, a spiritual realm. Okay? There's some things about this host. They're more numerous th- than the Syrian army. Uh, Elisha says they're more with us than there are with them. So God's got them outnumbered. Furthermore, he's got them outgunned. They've got horses and chariots. 
He's got horses and chariots of fire, okay? You're not going to do a whole lot to those things. Third, they're arrayed around Elisha. Now, again, put yourself in, Dothan is a, is a stronghold. It's sitting on top of a hill. It's a, it's a defensible position. The, the Syrians compass the city about, so they're surrounding the city. There's no escape for Elisha. But in between Elisha and the Syrians, compassed around them, is God's host. This angelic horde of defensible uh, position, uh, uh, this defensible army that can stand up to the Syrians. They're prepared. They're prepared, prepared to protect God's word. They're pre- prepared to protect God's messenger. But they're also prepared to sever some Syrian heads if the matter comes to a head. Gehazi was able to assess assess secular strength, but he had no perspective on the spiritual realm. It's something important for us to remember that when we say that every battle we face is actually a spiritual battle, that we need to see it in both dimensions. Okay, I'm not saying tonight that I'm, I'm going to sell you some, some spiritual goggles that you can put on your eyes when you walk out of this place and you can see the angelic armies that are sitting out there and the satanic armies and understand that there's a warfare that's going on there in the spiritual realm. Uh, I'm saying you need to understand the battles that you face in your life aren't just fought on a physical plane. They're fought directly with a, with a spiritual condition. Lisa and I have been married for 11 years, 2 months, and 21 days. I didn't get any applause there. More, probably more for her because she's in the nursery and uh, you understand what she had to put up for 11 years. In those 11 years, I've continually struggled and, and, and learned this idea that every battle we face is a spiritual battle. That when there's an argument or a spirited discussion, as we call them, uh, between husband and wife, this is not just a secular husband and a secular wife vying for dominance in a household. This is two Christians engaged in a spiritual battle, not between each other, but between a satanic force that would like to drive a wedge into a gospel-centered home and diminish the kingdom of God. And so there's sometimes in an argument where I have to pause, uh, spirited discussion in, a, in, a, in, a, in that realm, where I have to pause and say, okay, this, what we're fighting about doesn't matter. It, not, in the, not in just a, a, a direction of, of dominance in the household, but it doesn't matter in, the, in a spiritual condition. It doesn't matter for the advancement of the kingdom. We need to cool our jets here and talk this thing through. Uh, I'm not saying this, this evening, as you sometimes get the advice so often, uh, happy wife, happy life. You just, you just roll over and you just give her whatever she wants. Or, or that, uh, man, son, you really got to pick your battles and, and choose the ones that really matter. That Some battles are important, some battles are not. No, God commands a husband to lead. Uh, I, I've got a responsibility to direct my home. And so there are times where, Lisa, you just got to get on board. I'm, I'm preaching hard to her because she's in the nursery. She can't smack me for it. But how we fight those battles is a matter of perspective. Do I understand that my wife is not the enemy? Satan is. And he would love nothing more than for me to be angry with my spouse or for you to be angry with your spouse. I'm not saying there aren't battles worth fighting. There are plenty of them. I'm saying how you fight them determines or is determined by your perspective. Once you view the battle as a spiritual battle, your tactics change dramatically. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Man, that verse has come back to haunt me. Man, my mouth poured out foolishness. And I've had to go and apologize. Not because I was in the wrong position, but because I fought a physical battle instead of a spiritual one. It means when your teenage son comes up to you and he starts to stiffen that neck because of a rule or regulation that you passed down and said, you know, son, this is the way we're going to do things. He says, no, I'm 18. I'm a man now. I can do these things. He's not just a young man that's growing up and, and asserting his independence. There's a spiritual battle at play. And how you respond to that battle is determined by your perspective on it. If this is just a father and son, you know, fathers are going to get in in battles with a son. Someday a son's going to have to call the old man out. And there's just going to have to be that kind of struggle between father and son. It's been going on for centuries. That's a, a, a physical perspective. And you misunderstand that there's a spiritual component of this battle that will affect him the rest of his life. The streets this evening of Chicago are lined with young men that never learn to submit to authority. And you don't want that for your child. 
Children need strong discipline. They need to understand authority. In fact, Jesus Christ himself will rule with a rod of iron one day. But not every battle is fought like that. Plenty of times, grace and mercy need to be the concern. To love your child. To not provoke him to wrath, as the Bible says. You understand what 2 Corinthians says. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He says, you will never win a battle with your children by fighting them directly. These fisticuffs can beat up every one of my children. Okay, It's not a big announcement. All my kids are eight or under. But if I fight my kids, I lose. You need to grow your kids. And sometimes that involves strong discipline, but that can't be the only tool that's in your toolbox. I tell kids all the time, or I tell people all the time when discussing um, physical discipline, uh, that if you never spank your kids, you are a bad parent. Okay? Some people can disagree with me on that. Uh, you, you, I'm just telling you, that the, the word of God is on my side there. If you do not spank your kids, you are a bad parent. But if you only spank your kids, you're a bad parent. That God it says there's a perspective that you need to have that there's a spiritual battle that involves sometimes strong discipline to grow your child and sometimes mercy and grace to grow your child. And both tools need to be in our arsenal. And you need to have the perspective to know when to use each. A matter that only comes because God opens your eyes. Gehazi could assess strength, but he couldn't assess the spiritual. Why I tell you it's so important to have more than one tool in your toolbox because God uses well more than one tool in the conflict here this evening. Gehazi opens his eyes and he sees this heavenly horde of angels ready to go to battle, ready to draw their flaming sword. And I know that angels only go out by command of God's throne. But I have to uh, practically think that Michael and Gabriel, they got together and said, hey, uh, uh, the Syrians are marching on Elisha. They're going to come and take out God's man. And, and though God hadn't commanded them, they just start to slowly gather together the, 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 the people, uh, the, the, the soldiers in the, in the heavenly army, uh, Michael being the captain of that host there. And they're just kind of getting together there. And they're getting their swords polished up. They're getting their chariots. I'm just waiting for the Son of God to give them the word. And as they get all prepared for that, they stand by and wait until Jesus gives them the head nod. Yeah, you go stand between my man and the battle that he's about to face. And in an instant, 12 leagues of angels are standing there ready to defend in warfare against the Syrian host. And the Bible says in verse number uh, 19, Oh, sorry, verse number 18, it says, And when they came down to him, which means when they came and attacked, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite these people, I pray thee, with blindness. Which tells me that Michael and Gabriel never got to use those swords. God allowed an entire angelic host to come and assemble prepared for battle just to encourage Gehazi because they never fought with the Syrians. God is very able to fight warfare. In fact, it is only God's mercy that restrains his ability to fight warfare. The Bible says when they came down, which means when they started the attack, when these Syrians are coming, they draw swords, they're ready to kill Elisha, that it's Elisha that prays unto the Lord. And he says, instead of killing them, smite these people with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. That is Elisha that intercedes here and restrains back God's righteous indignation against the nation of Syria. The angels are prepared for war. It is only the mercy of God that restrains his wrath. You know, sometimes, uh, I'd say often, I call back to the sermon by Jonathan Edwards called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I do want to read this expert excerpt because the imagery in it has stuck with me ever since I was probably about eight years old when I first heard this the first time. He said in his sermon that God holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire. He abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks, on you, looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. 
He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times so abominable in his eyes as the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet, tis nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. Tis to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell thus last night, that you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. There is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose this morning, but that God's hand has held you up. The mercy of God paired with the justice and the holiness of God is something that we can't fathom in our sight, that God would be so holy to look upon us as loathsome, and yet it is his hand that holds back his wrath from being poured out upon us. We recoil today at any description of God that doesn't sound like Jesus, that doesn't let us catch a glimpse of his righteous, holy anger towards sin. But when you see that heavenly host assembled, ready for war, you get a picture of what God was prepared to do to the Syrians. There would have been no heavenly casualties, and the battle would have been severe. But equal to his justice is the overwhelming mercy he displays in our life on a daily basis. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Faithfulness to me? No, no, I'm variant. I'm, I'm a vapor. I, I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow. I'm, I'm completely unworthy of being faithful to but God is faithful to himself and to his mercy that will not let his justice pour out above his mercy. God holds back his anger. And in verse 19, he, or verse 18, he smites them with blindness. Uh, the word is a, only occurs, occurs here uh, and in um, Genesis one time, uh, but it means to, uh, it's a root word is light. It means to have a bright light uh, to, to blind you. So it's it kind of like the Hebrew word for bedazzled. I mean, they're just... And I can't think that maybe God just showed himself there for a moment and let his glory do the blinding there. It says that he blind them with a great light is the idea. And then in verse 18, Elisha comes to them and says, uh, uh, you guys need to understand, hey, you're at the wrong city. This is a mistaken identity here. You've got the wrong man. This is in the right place. Uh, this is not the way. Neither is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But instead, he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Syria. And the king of Israel, and the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Uh, again, Elisha uh, prays for them. They're, they're spared destruction. They just get blindness. And instead, he leads them by the hand to the capital city of Samaria. That's uh, uh, 10 miles away. I don't know how well you walk, about two miles an hour is an average. If you are blind, you don't walk very fast at all. And so for a span of five or six or seven hours, Elisha is leading this this host, this great host of horses and chariots and, and soldiers by the hand to the gates of Samaria. They must look very foolish. But he parades them right into the center, city center there of Samaria. He says, God, now open up their eyes. And when they open their eyes, they're surrounded by now a physical army. And uh, uh, the king of Israel, Jehoram, looks to uh, Elisha and says, my father, my father, uh, uh, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? You can see his eagerness there. I mean, is this the day? Do I get to wipe this host out that's been trying to kill me? But you can see a little bit of Jehoram's growth. He submits to Elisha. He calls him a sign of respect. He says, my father, uh, and gives him that authority there. He restrains his hand from uh, fighting them because of Elisha's word. And so we see here that Jehoram's had a little bit of spiritual growth. But Elisha tells him to spare them. Verse, 21 says, or verse 22 says, and he answered, thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So watch there again, God's mercy being poured out not just to his people, but to his enemies. As he, as he brings this host together, he says, hey, you're not going to kill these people. Uh, you would kill prisoners of war. That's not the same here. You're instead going to feed these people. You're going to set provision before them so that they can, uh, they're supposed to live, they're supposed to eat, uh, they're supposed to return unharmed to their master so they can go and tell their master. I can only imagine how that report must have gone. 
uh, Mr. Ben Haydad, sir, um, we're, we're the, the host you sent to capture Elijah. First of all, didn't go so well. Uh, you remember how he could see everything that you thought of? Well, guess what? He saw us coming. In fact, by the end of the story, uh, we couldn't see at all. Uh, is there hazard pay associated with this? Do we get veterans benefits uh, as a result of this? Because uh, I'm not going back on that battlefield against a man like Elisha. I can only understand that that is, again, God's mercy, not to the nation of Syria now, but specifically to Ben-Hadad. As I was giving him not two, not three times to warn him in his bedchamber, now he sends this roving man, this, this great host to come and capture Elijah, and they can return unharmed and well-fed to him and says, this is Ben-Hadad, this is who their God is. He's holding you like a spider over the fire, Ben-Hadad. It's time for you to submit and give up this warfare. Because God is not afraid of war. I mean, as we read through the book of Joshua, sometimes it offends our modern sensibilities with the way that God conducts holy war. He's not afraid to wipe out an enemy. But he is displaying here a mercy that is paired with his justice and his righteousness. Sometimes churches today vacillate between those two extremes. Uh, Jesus is either the, the hippie Jesus that just loves everybody and supports whatever democratic thing is coming out these days and there's just absolutely no uh, justice in his mind whatsoever or God is a vengeful God that is ready to drive a wedge and separate not just between the lost and the, and the righteous but between the righteous and the more righteous I mean sometimes we, we laugh about the, the, the woke agenda and how the, the left continually moves further and further and further left to where they can't even tolerate people like Bill Maher or J.K. Rowling I mean people that we would consider wildly over there and that the, now those people are getting lined up next to Trump oh, I, I, don't put me in those same camp sometimes Christians have that same attitude Oh, I'm not a Southern Baptist, I'm an Independent Baptist. Well, I'm not an Independent Baptist, I'm an Independent Baptist, KJV only. I'm in favor of both those things. But you can push yourself further and further and further to the extreme that raises standards higher and higher and higher and higher to where now only you can meet them. And God is for division. And God is for separation of doctrine. But we need to understand that God responds with both mercy and grace as often as he responds with righteousness and justice. And it takes both tools in God's toolbox to live a Christian life. The only way to know for a Christian whether to respond in a situation to justice or with justice or with mercy is to have the right perspective. Verse 23 ends with Syria leaving. It says, so the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Now, at first glance, that looks like a good thing. ben Hadad learns his lesson, and he, he leaves, and he's not going to come back anymore. The bands of, of Syria don't come back in Israel anymore. But the very next verse says, uh, And it came to pass after this that ben Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. So what does that mean? It means that ben Hadad saw God intervening in his life in the, in the realm of the camps, and he saw him intervene in his life at Dothan there. He saw him intervene when the men came back and gave the report. And he, made, he learned a lesson. He learned, I'm not going to try for secrecy anymore. I'm not going to try for assassination attempts anymore. I'm going to bring the entire might of my army. I'm going to come down and I'm going to stomp this Israeli uh, city out into the dust. I'm going to put myself on the throne of Samaria. Ben-Hadad learned nothing. You know, throughout this story, there's levels of perspective. There's this perspective of Elisha that is so in tune with God, God gives him special revelation to, to chart his life and the life of nations. He, he intervenes in, in specific moments, in specific times, only in the direction of God, and everything he touches in this story turns out to advance God's kingdom. And then there's the perspective of Gehazi that was, could assess the, the physical realm, but couldn't assess the spiritual realm. And so God opened his eyes to understand those spiritual battles. But there's a third perspective in here, and that is the perspective perspective of Ben Hadad who saw God work again and again and again and again and he was physically blind to the situation just as much as he was spiritually blind to the ways of God a matter of his perspective that caused rebellion in his heart that I think ends with Ben Hadad in hell today so the invitation tonight is simply which of those perspectives is yours we don't sit here tonight to gather and pass judgment on Ben-Hadad and his rebellion to see God work, but to pass judgment on ourselves. 
Are you so in tune with God that when the situations crop up that we can only term as battles, you choose the path directed by God that always advances his kingdom? Or do you find yourself sometimes trapped in those physical battles, those secular battles, those human battles that really have a spiritual component that we've been ignoring? Or maybe tonight you're here because you're supposed to be. Because God's been trying to get your attention of your heart, been trying to show you here and here and here and here again where you need to change. But the struggle's been there and the temptation's too great. It's much easier to put yourself on the throne than to submit to anyone claiming to be for God. Tonight you need to remember your perspective changes your tactics. You find this life too hard to fight, it's probably because you're fighting it by yourself. You find this life too hard to navigate, it's probably because you're not listening to God's direction. You find yourself on the throne too often, God's not just leaving you in a vacuum, he's showing you This isn't going to work out well for you. Don't put yourself on the throne. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Death, certainly for the lost estate that goes and spends eternity in hell. But sin never happens without something dying. Something in your family, something in your future, something in your life. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Tonight, this altar could be the place where you just need to submit Pray like Elisha did. God, open my eyes. Change my perspective on this thing. Whether it's a family struggle, whether it's a personal one, God, I need your direction in my life. Let's pray. Lord, once again, I'm I'm grateful for your word that pierces our lives. Lord, that reads us as often as we read it. And Lord, it, it points out very clearly situations and circumstances where We're at odds with your direction. Lord, help us to continually submit to your word. Because when we submit to you, our perspectives change, our direction changes to the way that you design, Lord. Nothing happens in our life but for our good and for your glory. So, Lord, don't let us continually uh, ram against the battles you face, you, you bring to us, Lord. Let us instead submit to you, change our perspective on them, and be used by you to succeed in them, Lord. Help us to win not for our measure, but for yours. And we ask this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're not doing business with the Lord, I invite you to stand. We're going to turn to 489. The song is, I have decided to follow Jesus. As the piano begins to play, if you're not doing business with the Lord, I, feel free to uh, think about those words. But if you're uh, doing business with the Lord, the altar is open. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back.
Well, amen. Well, thank you for your attention to the word tonight. Um, as far as announcements go, just remember to be in prayer for the, the kids at camp. Uh, I'll tell you from personal experience, uh, Wednesday night and Thursday night are the two most important days of camp. So I encourage you, tomorrow night as you're eating dinner, uh, they, I guess services start there probably about 6 o'clock. If, if you guys can just remember to set aside a moment, maybe m- m- right before you eat your meal or maybe just a, a, before then, uh, to, to really let God work there. Sometimes God takes two, three days to break through to kids. And, but once he does, Thursday's an awesome day. So uh, let's pray for them, especially this week. And then um, remember the wedding share that's coming up. Uh, Missions Committee, you have the meeting on the 20th, officers on the 21st, and then the Ministry of the Word Conference there on the 14th. So just mark all those days on your calendar. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Lord, again, so grateful for your inexhaustible mercy. Lord, that continually reaches out and reaches out to stubborn people like us, Lord. I pray that tonight as we sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, Lord, that really would be the direction that we walk out of here with, Lord. When we go back into the battlefields of our work and our school, Lord, that we do them with the right eyes on, Lord, that you would help us to be soul conscious in the world that we live in. We ask this thing in Jesus' name. Amen.